Eternal God and our Father, we thank you. We bless you. We exalt you. We adore you. We magnify you. We humble ourselves before you. We acknowledge your grandeur, your majesty, your splendor, and your glory. And we thank you, Lord, for one more time to gather together at this sanctified place with brothers and sisters of like precious faith that we might lift our voice as one in, a, in praise and adoration to you. Father, we pray that you would meet with us as we now gather around your word. That your Holy Spirit would take the things of God in Christ and open them to us. That your word that's alive and active and powerful will speak to us. Give us encouragement and direction. Grant us peace and tranquility. Pray for the quickening of your word in our lives. We pray that you might speak to that man or woman, boy or girl, who's trying to find their way. Don't know which way to turn. Unsure and uncertain. We pray that today they might realize that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes unto the Father except by him. We pray that they might realize that Jesus is a bridge over troubled water. That they might realize that Jesus is a fountain and a desert and a barren land. That Jesus is the bread of life in a land where there's famine. That Jesus is a shelter in the time of a storm. That Jesus is a rock of Gibraltar when the whole world is wheeling on its axis. We pray that the day they might realize that Jesus Christ is what their soul is longing for. A personal relationship with him. Will you speak, Father? To the end, Someone might be saved, that a backslider might be restored, that the saints of God might be encouraged. Speak, Father. In Jesus' name. Remain standing, please, and turn to the third chapter of the book of Acts. acts of the Holy Spirit in and through the apostles. Acts chapter 3. <clears throat> Acts chapter 3, and I would like to begin reading with verse 1 of Acts chapter 3. Acts in the New Testament. It's the fifth book of the canon of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then the Acts. Verse 1. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man laying from his mother's womb was carried when they lay daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him, with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none. But such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he leaping up stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement mm -hmm. at that which had happened 
unto him. May the Lord's first blessing be upon his word. May it be sanctified in our hearts. You may be seated. I want to speak to you this morning from the subject of a crippled man at the door of the church. A crippled man at the door of the church. Those of us who know and love and attempt to serve the Lord Jesus Christ realize that ministry and service is often very demanding because needs are unceasing and problems and pressures and perplexities that people are dealing with in their lives, they do not schedule themselves neatly within the time that we would set aside to try to serve. Mm -hmm. And all of us here, when we have a need, we want our need met. Yes, sir. And we want it met at the time that we have the need. And God strategically places us in the body of Christ in the church that we might minister to each other and that we might bind up the open wounds, that we might bring healing and comfort to the bruised spirit. Now, the purpose for getting healed is not to be healed for healing's sake. God brings healing to us through other people that we might be strong enough to serve and that we might be strong enough to minister. So we all have a responsibility to find someone that is weaker than we are, to find someone that's in worse shape than what we're in. And the little strength that we have, use it to serve someone else, to help them become strong. And if we make that commitment mutually within the body of Christ, then everyone will have someone that is ministering to them and that is committed to helping them to become whole and functional within the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. And as long as there's one member of the body of Christ that is not functioning properly, then what it does, it overloads the spiritual circuitry of the church. Now we have a power surge on last Sunday morning. And I was sitting there watching you out there, the temperatures have been unseasonably hot not in recent memory have we had a drought in June and temperatures scaling the upper 90s for several days without any relief. And due to the, the construction of our building, it's all brick and with all the windows and so it's sort of a heat sink and it just kind of sucks heat into it. And the air conditioners have been working overtime and double time and triple time. And on last Sunday, it got so hot that the air conditioning compressors were laboring tirelessly to try to keep us cooled down, so much so that it finally blew a circuit and kicked a breaker. And I knew what had happened because I could immediately tell that it was getting warm in here. And you start fanning faster. And the more of y'all to pick up those fans, the harder I get just watching y'all fan. But the, the compressors became overloaded. And so one of the units was shut off, and it was shut off through the entire service. And so by the end of the service, the temperature in here had risen of several degrees. Anytime the circuitry is overloaded, then something's going to give. And that's what fuses are for. You see, fuses keep you from blowing up your refrigerator or from shutting down your television because the fuse goes first and it kicks the brake. I remember when I was a kid growing up in the country, you know, before they put the fuse boxes in, and like the brakes that would kick, and they'd have those little round fuses. Yeah. And the fuse was of high premium. And so we'd put pennies in the fuse box. And I know that was a fire waiting to happen, but we'd put pennies in the fuse box, and they put the old fuse back in. And some kind of way get things running again. Your brother Kaya, he's here this morning, and he knows all about HVAC systems. You know, he has the company, and he knows all about that type of business. He knows we should have been doing that. We would do it anyway, to try to buy some time. 
In our text this morning, we come to the Acts chapter 3. And we see here in this particular text, as it opens, it says that Peter and John was going up together to the temple at the hour of prayer because it was the ninth hour. Now, the church has only been established for a couple of days there in Jerusalem. And so the early church, which was comprised up of Jews who had been saved out of Judaism, and now they had embraced the Lord Jesus Christ, but they maintained much of their Jewish custom. And a part of the Jewish custom was that at least three times a day, they would go to the temple and pray. And so Peter and John was maintaining this vigil. And they also used it as an opportunity now to share their new found faith. You'll be amazed at the opportunities for service that will present themselves merely when people show up where God has promised to meet us. And God has promised to meet us when we gather together at the church. That's why the writer of Hebrews writes in Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, he says, don't forsake the assembly of yourselves together as the matter of some is. But if I were to paraphrase, he says that when you see the evil day approaching, don't stay home. When you see the evil day approaching, don't stop going to prayer meeting. When you see the evil day approaching, don't just forget about evening service. But when you see the even, evil day approaching, be more diligent and more committed to assembling together with the people of God. Because the more evil the days are that are approaching, the more powerful the Holy Spirit will be in ministering to the people of God, creating visible testimonies of the power of God in the lives of his people. And so because Peter and John were maintaining his vigil to go to the prayer meeting to pray and to seek the face of God, they encounter this opportunity for service. Verse 2. He says, And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. Here we're introduced in verse 2 to this crippled man. And look at his condition. His condition is that he is crippled. He is a quadriplegic. And the text says that it was congenital condition because he had been crippled from his mother's womb, from birth. And so this was some hereditary malady that had sapped him of his physical faculties. And so he had lived all of his days in this paralyzed condition. He was in bad shape. Now, in his case, it was not that he had had a physical fall. It was hereditary. Hereditary. You know, we can identify with him because we all have a congenital disease, and it's called sin. Mm -hmm. And it's hereditary. Our mother and fathers were sinners. Our grandparents were sinners. Our great-great-grandparents were sinners. And we can trace it all the way back to the first parent, Adam, and his wife Eve, and they were sinners, and that congenial condition is passed down from generation to generation. True. We're born in sin, the Bible says, and we're shaped in iniquity. This, this physical paralysis that this man had, it is a symbolic of, of sin that paralyzes the soul and the spirit of the individual. We're born in that situation. We're born in that situation in need of someone to deliver us. You see, I'm sure this parent of this boy, that they had great hopes when her mother was carrying this child around in her womb. Every parent dies. Great hopes that maybe my son or daughter would grow up and make some noble contribution to the society. Every Jewish parent during this time in ancient Palestine, the prayer was that maybe they would give birth to a great prophet, to a great deliverer, to one who would lead the people of God. And so I'm sure that this, these parents were, were very hopeful when their child was born. But their hopes were assassinated. Their hopes were mitigated when they saw that this little boy had crippled feet, crippled legs, and crippled limbs. 
I'm reminded of the Old Testament. Remember the story about Jonathan and David? And how God had knitted Jonathan and David's hearts together. And their relationship was a stronger bond than blood brothers. The only problem was is that Jonathan's father, Saul, he hated and despised David because he saw David as a threat to his empire and a threat to his kingdom. And Saul had attempted to have David assassinated. And he himself had tried to kill David himself. But nothing could reach between Jonathan and David because they were soul brothers. And even the hatred and, and the anger and the bitterness of Jonathan's father could not turn his heart against his soul brother David. The Bible said in time, Saul died. Jonathan also died. But David remembered the friend, his friend Jonathan. And so when David came to the kingdom, he went into the city and he says, is there anybody here left from Jonathan's house? He says, if there's anybody left from Jonathan's house, I want to show them favor because Jonathan was my friend when I needed a friend. Jonathan stuck with me through thick and thick. Then even denying the commandments of his daddy. Is anybody who left from Jonathan's house? Okay. And somebody said, that's a little old crippled boy. <laughs> he's just a cripple. He's crippled on his feet. He lived down in a place called Lowy Bar. That's on the outskirts of the city. No man's land. He lived down in Lowy Bar, and he, he's dirt poor because he's crippled from his feet, and he became crippled during a wartime, and his nurse was running with him uh, from the village to escape the onslaught of those who would attack us, and she fell on him, and he's left crippled. He had a terrible fall. Oh, we can identify with this little crippled boy. His name was Meshavaphat, and he was crippled in his feet, and he was crippled because of a fall. You see, we've been crippled because of a fall. Yeah. A fall that happened many millennia ago. When Adam and Eve disobeyed God in the Eden, that was a fall. Yeah. And just like Humpty Dumpty who sat on the wall and had that great fall, and all of the king's horses and all of the king's men could not put Mr. Dumpty back together again. When Adam fell in the garden, we fell. Yeah. And when Adam fell, a spiritual birth defect developed inside of him and his wife Eve, and that spiritual disease is passed on to all of us. And so we're born crippled. We're born in need. And some of us, because we're born in middle class, upper middle class family with silver spoons and forks in our mouths, we think that gives us some great grand privilege. We still have a great spiritual need. And we still are spiritual quadriplegics. Look at what the text says. He says, they laid this crippled man down daily at the temple, which is called beautiful to ask alms of them that enter into the temple. But this is interesting. The man may have been lame. He may have been crippled, but he wasn't crazy. And he figured out that the best place probably for me to beg for alms is at the church. Because there are a few folk that go there who might really know God. And they might have the compassion of God in their hearts. And so they might toss me a coin every now and then. Not only was this man crippled, was his condition, but he had become dependent. Dependent upon someone else to carry him to the temple. Dependent upon someone else to meet his needs financially. He had become dependent upon someone else. You see, sin makes us dependent. And we become dependent upon other people to, to prop us up. And we depend upon other people to build up our self-esteem. And I'm a little bit alarmed by the, all this self-esteem talk. You see, because if you, if you let, get people feeling too good about themselves apart from the Lord, they will conclude that they don't need God. Yeah, 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 that's true. If people start thinking highly of themselves, uh, Without God, then why in the world do they need God? I was up last night far, far later than what I should have been up, and I flipped the TV channel on, and something caught my attention. There was this movie on, and there was this physician, and he's been sued for malpractice. And he had performed a surgery, and he had removed a lady's reproductive organs that without proper permission, and, 
And so now he was being brought before the board and they were filing suit against him. And the chief of medicine had passed this particular position over for a high paid position. But now he's trying to defend him against this lawsuit. But he had written something down in this man's performance evaluation. And he had written down that this fellow suffers from a God complex. And the opposing attorneys had did some investigation and they had gotten the records. And so they challenged this boss and said, you said this guy had a God complex. What do you mean by that? And so the chief of medicine was trying to defend. And this doctor in his area, she, he spoke to me. Let me speak for myself. He said, you people go into the chapel and you bow down on your knees and you read from an old book and you pray to God. But when has God ever showed up in an operating room? And when has God, has God ever performed a search? He says, if you want to see God, then show up in the morning at 9 o'clock in operating room 2, and you'll see God in action. He said, because I am God. And then he began to spout all of his credentials, Harvard Medical School, and certified by so many boards and so many licenses. And I said to myself, what an illustration. And what happens to men and women when they get ahead full of knowledge that's not regulated by the Holy Spirit? And an arrogance set in and the audacity to say that, that I am God. And there are many people who don't say it, but they believe it. Amen. There are many people who suffer from a God complex. Yeah. And so people start feeling too good about themselves. Without a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, they will deceive themselves into believing that they don't need God. Amen. And so a good, healthy dose of guilt and shame has never hurt anybody. We ought to feel just a bit guilty. You know why? Because we are guilty. For the Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that seek after God. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The way to the sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We ought to feel just a little bit guilty because we are guilty. And guilt is the way God, the Holy Spirit, touches our conscience to prod us and to push us toward God to push us toward the source of healing and deliverance, to push us toward the antidote for the guilt. The only antidote for guilt and shame is the grace of God and forgiveness that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. And so we ought to feel guilty because we are guilty. And we are dependent. And so we see this man. Verse 3 says, Who sent Peter and John about to go into the temple asked in arms, we see his cry. His cry is to beg and to plead for physical sustenance, to beg and to plead for money. So he begs and he pleads and he requests that they might give him just a piece of change. Then his first change, and then Peter fastened his eyes upon him with John and said, look on. And we see their charge. Peter and John were just poor preachers. <laughs> they quit their jobs. They had a very lucrative business as fishermen on the Sea of Galilee. They had their own boat and they had their own hired servants and they had all of their own fishing tackle and they were doing quite well. But this Jesus from Nazareth that came and called them one day and said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. They were initially deceived and they they thought that he was going to usher in the kingdom, and so anything that they would forfeit by following him, they would regain in just a short period of time. So they left everything to follow Jesus. And now he had left them. And he had left them with a fledgling congregation that didn't even have a building. But they knew the power of God. And so they look at this guy, the Bible says, and they said, you look on us. And this guy was expecting for them to give him an offering. They were expecting for them, for them to open their pocketbooks and pull out some change. But he looked over. In verse 6, then Peter said, silver and gold have I not. But such as I have, give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. What the church needs to do is to return to a faith un 
unwavering, unblinking, unflinting faith in the power of the Word of God to change the lives of people. We ourselves are allowing ourselves to be seduced into believing that the answer to people's perplexing questions rest and reside somewhere in some psychiatrist's office or in some psychologist's counseling session or through some self-help program. The pressing need of the souls of people is that they might experience forgiveness that comes through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That the Spirit of God will come and touch their heart, their mind, their soul, and their spirit. Don't you know that when we fell in Adam, we didn't just fall spiritually. We fell mentally. We fell intellectually. In the Garden of Eden, after God had created everything in the Garden of Eden, all the animals, all the wildlife, he brought the animals to Adam, and Adam named all the animals. The guy's IQ was incredible. Because his mind had not been polluted by sin and guilt or shame, he named all the animals. Now, we can't even pronounce the names of all the animals. Because we fail mentally. Not only we fall intellectually and mentally, but we also fail socially. There is a curse that is on the earth. And every institution is under that curse. Whether it's the home, the family, the church, the community, all of society is under the curse of sin. Yes. And the only way we can function under this curse, the only way we're not overwhelmed by the magnitude of the problem, is when we are energized by the grace of God. And when we sense God's presence and we realize that greater is he that is with us than he that is in the world. And so Peter and John, looking at this man, they understood that his greatest problem was not his physical paralysis. You know, most people really aren't looking for God. Most people are looking for relief. If they can find relief for their condition, their situation, then they'll move on. If they can find some relief from the pressure and the pain and the discomfort, they can move on. And that's why psychological gymnastics is dangerous. When people are talking about, man, I feel bad because of what I've done. I feel this sense of guilt and shame. And then someone tells me, well, don't feel too bad about it. It's no big deal. Most people live worse than you. And so when you apply a little psychological side to people's guilt and conscience, then they move another rung down on the moral ladder. They say, well, it's just not too bad. I shouldn't feel bad about it, so I'm not going to feel bad about it. And one of the problems that we see in our society is we see that people are becoming anesthetized to feeling bad, to feeling guilt or feeling shame. No sense of innocence. No blushing, no embarrassment. There are some things we ought to be embarrassed about. So Peter and John understood. That this man's condition, his real heart problem, it wasn't his physical paralysis. It was the condition of his soul. Yes. And so they say to him, the gold and silver we don't have. But as much as we do have, we give to you. And they say, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Let's stop right there. Am I suggesting that we can go through the cities of Charleston looking for people that are paralyzed and stand over all of those people and say, in the name of Jesus, get up and walk, and that everyone that we speak to is going to get up and walk? I don't think so. I don't think that that's going to happen. It can happen. God can still miraculously heal. But the purpose of the miracles in the Bible are not merely to draw attention to a person's physical situation or to merely alleviate physical suffering, the purpose of miracles in the Bible is to establish the authority of the Word of God. And they didn't have a bound New Testament because they were living out the New Testament. And so God was establishing these men as his authoritative mouthpieces and that when they spoke, they spoke ex cathedra, they spoke from the mouth of God. And so God would often accompany their words in the earlier chapter of the book of Acts with supernatural displays of power. 
to show that there was power in the name of Jesus. Now what am I saying? I am saying the same power that was in the name of Jesus in Acts chapter 3, that same power is in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, June the 14th or 13th, 1999. The power is still there. But God may choose to unleash that power in a different way. God may not choose to just raise people up that are physically paralyzed. But God may choose to use us to share the gospel of Jesus Christ and to tell people they can find forgiveness for their sin, purpose for their life, encouragement for their spirits by believing in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That God can still energize his word and the power of the name of Jesus Christ to speak to crack addicts and cocaine addicts and to alcoholics and to drug addicts and say there's power in the name of Jesus Christ. And it doesn't take 12 steps to get there. It only takes one step. That one step of faith to recognize that the pressing need in my soul is for forgiveness. And that Jesus Christ offers to me forgiveness as a free gift. That forgiveness is the real issue. Me being forgiven and receiving that forgiveness and the peace of mind that comes along with being granted a judicial pardon by the sovereign judge of the universe. And then God's power can work in and through me after I am forgiven to help me break, or break the cycle of addiction and dependency to artificial stimuli. That's the way God might choose to unleash his power today, my beloved. God may choose to unleash his power today in and through the church by working through the church and giving people joy and spirits of, of happiness and contentment so that when people are depressed and melancholy and beaten down by the pressures and problems and disappointments of life, someone will come alongside of them and say, cheer up, my brother. Cheer up, my sister. Live in the sunshine. We'll understand it all better by and by. God may not change the circumstance or the situation, but he changes your perspective. And if he changes your perspective, that is a miracle nonetheless. Because God has lifted you up a little bit higher so that you might see that the things that are done beneath the sun it is the end of it all. It is the end of it all. God still works. He still works. But look at that, what else happens. The Bible says they took him by the right hand. And I believe that the application there is that to help people, to empower people, to break the cycles that are in people's lives, we got to touch folks' lives. we got to get involved in people's lives. It's got to be more than a few sanctified prayers or a sanctified sermon every now and then. We've got to get up close and personal and touch people's life and say, not only, not only let me tell you what you need to do, let me show you how to do it. Right. So they grabbed him by the hand. Give me five more minutes and I'll be through. And the Bible says that immediately his strength and ankle bone received strength. And he leaping up stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him and walking and praising God. That was a commotion that took place. You see, when God moves by his power, when God moves by his spirit, it should stir up a commotion. As a matter of fact, when God really moves by his power, it creates some confusion that requires an explanation. And God uses a commotion to set the stage for the explanation. You remember in Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came. The 120, they spoke with other tongues, languages, as the Spirit of God gave them utterance. The crowd, they were perplexed. There was a holy commotion that took place in Jerusalem. They didn't know what was going on. Some of them said, they're drunk, they're intoxicated, they're inebriated. It's just early in the day, and they're already drunk. A commotion took place. But the commotion sets, sets the stage for the proclamation of the word of God. And then Peter stood up and he preached Christ in Acts 2. After this man was touched by the power of God in Acts chapter 3, the Bible says he leaped, he praised God, he caused a great commotion. And that great commotion sets the stage for verse 11. And as a lame man, verse 10, 
And they knew that it was he which set the alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. You see, when God moves by his power, it confuses the masses. They were amazed. They were awestruck that this man who had been crippled from birth now was leaping and praising God. Now let me ask you a question. Has God done anything in your life that leaves somebody surprised? Someone ought to be awestruck. Someone that knew you well, that knew the inner workings of your life, will they now look at you in Christ after Calvary, and they see the change that has come over you since you put your faith in Jesus Christ. They ought to be amazed. Somebody ought to be surprised and shocked at the way you live in your fervent commitment to the word of God, your commitment to service, the change in your life, the habits that have been broken, your commitment to personal holiness, somebody ought to be amazed. And so the Bible says they were amazed. Mm -hmm. And that set the stage for Peter to stand up and preach Christ to the masses and to the multitudes. What are you saying, preacher? What I'm saying is this. That in the providence of God, in the plan of God, mm -hmm. it pleases God to take broken lives and touch broken lives to get the attention of those people who think that they are whole. Now, sometimes God will touch a broken life and put it back together again, do what Mr. Dumpty could not have done for him. God will put them back together again. But sometimes God takes the broken pieces, the broken life, and he doesn't put it all back together again. But he works in through the broken, fragmented pieces. He works through the disfigured body. He works through the dysfunctional life. He works through all of the confusion and chaos that is surrounding you. And that in itself becomes a miracle. And so people start to ask the question, how in the world can she still be praising God and her son is on drugs and her daughter is a prostitute? Her life is still broken, is still disfigured, but she's still worshiping and praising God and testifying about how good God is. God takes the broken lives and works through the broken lives. How can he still worship God and still be faithful and true to God? Laid off on his job, cannot find gainful employment, been brutalized everywhere he goes, but still talking about great is the Lord and worthy to be praised. God works through the brokenness, yeah. through the fragmented pieces, right. to get people's attention, to realize there has to be a divine God somewhere. There has to be a majestic hand somewhere behind the scene moving and tugging and pushing and shoving and coordinating and choreographing and encouraging and lifting and strengthening and energizing. That's the way God works sometimes. And so sometimes all you can do is just come to church and just maybe sit out in front of the door. Maybe you're so tired and you're so beat down you feel like this crippled man, as far as they would bring you, into the front of the door. And you sit at the front of the door and maybe, maybe somebody will come by and have mercy on you. Maybe somebody will come by and pray for you and encourage you. You see, every day isn't like Sunday. There are some difficult days. There are some hard crises. There, there are some times we just don't want to get up in the morning. You don't want to face the public. And there are some times you've got to force yourself to do it. You've got to force yourself to do what you know you need to do. But in the nick of time, God will send somebody. Somewhere along the way, you'll pass some saint in the thoroughfare of life. And someone will remind you, God still sits high, and he still sits low. And every now and then, when you're about ready to give up and throw in the towel, you'll hear somebody stand up and testify. And like a neon light will go off, you'll say, I remember when they were wearing that, Lord, and what I am now. I remember when they were so far down, they could never see their way up. But now they're standing and testifying, and it'll perk up your spirit. He said, God can rescue and salvage that situation. Maybe there is 
there's hope for me. So maybe I ought to dust myself off and clean myself up and present myself before the Lord. And maybe God might bless me too. He still uses the cripple and the disfigured. Oh, I wish you had time. And I would talk to you about the crowd that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He said, you see your calling, brethren. Not many noble are called. Not many wise are called. Not many prudent are called. Not many. But God, it pleases God to take the foolish things, the broken things, the disfigured things, the beaten down things, the downcast things, the outcast things. It pleases God to take, take the throwaway things. And then take his hand and make the throwaway thing a beautiful masterpiece for his trophy king. Why does he do that, Paul? He says, so that no flesh can glory in his presence. So that nobody can say, man, what a bargain God got when I got saved. But he really had something to work with. I had all the right stuff, and all I needed was a little bit of the ingredient of the Holy Ghost. No, it didn't work like that. No, it didn't work like that at all. God, when he found you, you were broken and you were beaten down at the end of your road, right. didn't know how you were going to make it. That's right. And God didn't get no deal, he didn't get no bargain, he got you. Right. Or oh, he got me. He didn't get no bargain. He got a bunch of cripples. That's right. A bunch of Mephibosheths who was crippling our feet and our limbs. Incapacitated. But he energizes us by his spirit, amen? Yeah. And he strengthens us day by day. And though the outward man might be perished, uh -huh. the inward man is being renewed right. day by day. So you be encouraged. You keep looking to him. You keep drawing strength from him. From him. And you keep believing that he has touched your life and he's working in and through your life. And stay close to the people of God. I don't say that because I'm trying to build some great church. The more people come, the more problems we have. As a matter of fact, life is a lot simpler when we only had 35. <laughs> I said it because I believe in the church. I believe in the church. And I believe that God reserves just special manifestations of his spirit. I believe that God does things through the corporate people of God, through the congregation. I want folk to come so they can get their blessing. You see, when you're able body. Able mentally, and God calls us to come together and come to the church. Well, there's some things that God just won't deliver to your house. Pizza Hut will bring you pizza. Papa John's will bring you pizza. But there are some spiritual blessings that God says you come to where the place that I've set aside for my people to be at, and when you show up there, I'm going to show up there. And I'm going to have a great big bucket full of blessings, and I'm going to have a dip of the dip amount with it. You be there with your cup, and you'll get your portion. Amen. If not, then you go hungry <laughs> to the next meal. Can I close the illustration? Yes, sir. The spirit of my grandmother is rising up inside of me now. Dinner was served at a particular time. That's when dinner was served. Now, if you didn't show up, not coming up in there, busting up in the kitchen, pots and pans, taking stuff out of the refrigerator. Oh no, oh no. The kitchen is closed. That's right. At seven o'clock, the kitchen is closed. That's what she would say. And she was out there catering no meals all over the community in the neighborhood. I, when dinner is served, you better show up. But there was always plenty to eat, but you had to be there. When dinner was served, when God calls his children together to serve our meals, you got to be there. If not, you got to fast until next week. Or maybe like my little daughter, you know, she got where she can cook now. And, uh, you know, she got all these braces in her mouth, and so her mouth is sometimes sore, but she can work with some oodles of noodles. So she can <laughs> make her way to the microwave until she can boil her some water. And she can make it. Until mom gets there, you fix her something she can deal with. Because when we come to the kitchen, they say, Dad, please don't cook. <laughs> Let's buy together, shall we?